Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can I be heard through this? Is it working? Hello? No. Excuse me. Sorry? You can you can hear something? Hello? Right, strange. Okay. Okay, well good uh, good morning everyone. We should uh, we should get started. And I guess I might still need some more volume. Or maybe not. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm uh, your moderator for today. My name's Paul Wilson from APNIC. Um, we're the regional internet registry for Asia Pacific and quite involved with, with internet development activities around, um, around our region, including to some extent community networks. Uh, but this, uh, this session is on uh, scaling community networks, uh, exploring blockchain and efficient investment strategies. So if that's not the workshop that you're looking for, then um, please stay because this one's going to be pretty good. Um, the, uh, to explain some of the background, this uh, was originally two workshops. So uh, the, in terms of the workshop proposals which went into the, into the IGF MAG, there was one on investment strategies for scaling community networks. There was one on blockchain and community networks as friends or foes. So in the wisdom of the MAG, it was decided to bring these two uh, workshops together. And that's going to create a pretty in interesting uh, combination with a lot to talk about and, and quite a few speakers, which is great to see. So thanks for, for turning up. Um, the organisers of the uh, workshop uh, have been uh, Carolina Kaira from Lacknick here and Stav, uh, Stavrula Maglavera from the University of Thessaly. Welcome. Um, the sort of convergence of the two workshops is really a, a common theme of how uh, community networks can be sustained and scaled up through new investment, through new investment in new opportunities and strategies for community networks and also through new technologies uh, such as blockchain, which has been suggested as just one example actually that we'll be focusing on here um, amongst many. Uh, so I think um, what we have in the room, it's fantastic to see, we've got a, quite a few hands-on uh, practitioners here from community, net community networks themselves and I hope we'll be hearing about um, you know, what's the latest thinking and strategies uh, and, uh, and interests, um, what's happening in the environment of community networks uh, these days. We have some uh, technologists here to um, talk uh, about uh, what they think and if they think there are new opportunities coming up, uh, blockchain or otherwise. And we also um, have some donors and investors in community networks and I think we'll be very interested to hear about their, uh, their experiences with community networks and uh, current interests. What are, uh, what are you as investors um, looking for specifically in, in community network projects today and where would they fit uh, into your broader categories? And so the idea is to um, talk about how these things can all be matched up um, in the tango that is uh, investment uh, and funding these days, as, as Carolina put it yesterday, which I think is a suitably Latin <laughs> metaphor, the tango of projects and, uh, and donors. So we've got um, quite a few speakers, about four minutes uh, each, followed by some discussion. I really hope that, um, that the practitioners here uh, spe speaking on the panel or otherwise um, will get stuck into the discussion and make it a lively session. Now I've been uh, given or suggested three, three questions to put uh, to panellists as you speak. Uh, so if you wish then please um, uh, try and address uh, any or all of these. Um, specifically, to what extent do current community network strategies, uh, both donors and networks own strategies, address the needs of stakeholders in community networks? That's the first. Are there new aspects, uh, circumstances or opportunities, strategies or technologies uh, that um, can improve the effectiveness of, of investments in um, allowing community networks to grow and proliferate? And also how can we leverage or work with uh, grassroots initiatives for digital inclusion and sort of embed them in the uh, development of community network models? So I'm going to invite uh, speakers uh, sort of in turn, but I'll, I'll ask you to, uh, to introduce yourselves. And uh, I'll start with Carolina from Lacknick. 
All right, can you hear me? Uh, all right, well, thank you, Paul, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so, um, as Paul mentioned, I am uh, with LACNIC, more specifically the FRIDA program and Seed Alliance. Um, Seed Alliance is a coalition of grants and awards programs uh, run by the regional internet registries of um, Africa, Asia Pacific, um, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and essentially, the, uh, the Seed Alliance supports uh, innovations on internet development across our three regions of work. Um, just to sort of uh, get you a sense of who we work with from uh, the donors uh, present at this round table, we work with um, IDRC and Internet Society. We have also worked in the past with our colleagues uh, from CEDA as well. Um, so um, before getting started, I would like to say a few words about uh, the Seed Alliance's um, funding strategy around community networks, and then I'll jump into some uh, reflections actually about Paul's uh, first question, to, to what extent do current strategies address the needs of community networks. So I think uh, one important thing to highlight um, about the Seed Alliance is that um, we have been, I guess, uh, early supporters of community-based connectivity efforts. Uh, we started supporting uh, community networks as early as 2012. Uh, so for instance, uh, Tobetsa, Sansalini Networks in South Africa, Nepal Wireless, uh, or child in India, Altamundi in Argentina, just to mention uh, a few. And we have also been supporters of the Libre Router, which has actually brought together uh, you know, several people in this room um, uh, in, in that project. So um, jumping to, you know, sort of directly to our funding strategy in 2018 and with the generous support actually of our colleagues from uh, Internet Society, um, we started offering uh, a funding, funding line exclusively on community networks. Um, and that was sort of a very sort of a exciting shift for us because it allowed us to start uh, focusing on what we understood are sort of the core challenges um, that community networks are facing today. So essentially we decided to support um, innovations across four areas or four topics. Uh, the the uh, development of uh, technical innovations, be it hardware, software, or combination of the two, as uh, it was the case with the Libre Router. Um, we um, also supported um, business models for making community networks uh, sustainable, which I understand is sort of a, a concern uh, for multiple donors working on uh, or supporting investing in community networks. Uh, uh, and also while well, enabling regulation and development of local content. So now going to, to, to the question of, you, you know, to what extent do current strategies address uh, the needs of community networks, I wanted to share the case of, um, of FRIDA, the FRIDA program, the, the Latin American program, which I coordinate, uh, where we had a bit of, a, in our 2018 uh, call for proposals, a, a bit of a mismatch, uh, if you will, between uh, the type of applications that we were um, expecting to get and the applications that we actually got. Um, so essentially we open up our uh, call for proposals on these four topics that I mentioned before, um, but applications for projects that came in were uh, primarily looking at creating new networks. Um, so essentially we, um, we had grassroots organizations applying that had uh, a lot of experience working collectively. Uh, that had a clear purpose to want to connect. Um, so essentially they were proposing, uh, I don't know, to close uh, the gap, um, uh, the digital gap uh, uh, with indigenous communities, use connectivity for economic empowerment, education, local content. Um, but however, we did see that some of these organizations were unclear as to what techno uh, technologies were available to them. Uh, they were unclear in some cases um, about how to achieve connectivity um, and how uh, to achieve also the sustainability of those networks. So essentially, we, you know, there were sort of two key takeaways from, from this experience for the FRIDA program. The first one is that new organizations are looking to replicate community networks. Um, so when we um, talk about scaling up community networks, at least in the, in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, we're seeing definitely a window of opportunity. Uh, there's uh, organizations that want to uh, restore to community networking as a solution to achieve connectivity. Um, and we also realized that it's very important as a strategy to resort uh, to knowledge transfer from existing and consolidated networks uh, to new communities that are looking to, to connect. Um, and here I think it is fair to say that there's organizations already working on this. Uh, Internet Society is actually doing a wonderful work uh, on this front worldwide. Um, and um, also we have um, Rizomatic Alter Mundi within Latin America working on this. Uh, but you know, if we are to say that you know, there's 
uh, a conclusion or something that we are hearing from our pool of applicants is that there's more work to be uh, done on this front. So I will stop it at that. I have some other sh uh, thoughts to share, but uh, I'll save them for the discussion. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Carolina. That's a, that's a good summary, I think, of some of the thinking that's, um, that's currently going on in, in uh, projects in the field. But um, we also have Carlos from, uh, from APC, and I think APC's approach is, uh, is really uh, good to hear about. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, hello, Paul, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak at the session. Um, well, I, I'm going to address at least two of the, of the three questions, and I think the current investment models that there are for connectivity are not actually uh, addressing the, the reality of, of community networks, right? They are not working. I think they are stuck on a for-profit extractive model that, um, that is, not, is not conducive for some of the models that, that are being put forward in the, in the movement of community networks. Um, those financial instruments are, are rooted in the paradigm of large operators that can absorb large capital uh, at once. And, uh, and even with those investments, they are failing to, to connect the unconnected. And, um, and <laughs> Um, there is a market failure. Those models are plateauing. Those uh, traditional models, even with that investment, even with capex from from universal service and access funds in many countries, are subsidizing investment, and, and the, the, the the base stations uh, stop working after a year because they don't have a return on investment there because their their business models are too costly for for the areas where they are trying to to provide service. So in this market failure scenario, we need to innovate. We need fresh thinking. We need to think outside of the box. And I'm not saying that connectivity should be free. I'm not saying that uh, everything should be subsidized. I think that all the, I, I'm, I'm proposing that from all the costs that there is in the, in the value chain of, of providing telecommunications, I think there is opportunities to reduce a lot of them uh, with not that much effort. I mean, if, all the investment financial instruments that are out there, when they finance, they, 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 they enforce or they put policies and clauses and conditions that enforce infrastructure sharing, that enforce a, a commons based use of the, of the fiber optic that they are deploying or infrastructure sharing on the towers that they are, that they are um, subsidizing or free access to community networks to any of those resources, then that cost would go down and eventually those, those business models will start making sense for those that are looking at this from a social development perspective and not from a for-profit uh, capitalist thinking. Uh, because the business models that Carolina was saying are all about resource sharing. And most of the organizations here are about not only sharing those resources that are physical infrastructure, but about sharing human resources to actually provide those skills and provide that training to, to those communities that actually want to do it. So let's try to, from a donor's perspective, re try to reduce all those costs as much as possible. So then the business models and, and, the, and the people without resources in rural and marginalized areas are able to benefit as well from, from connectivity. And it's very interesting. I think we are putting a lot of pressure on community networks, right? Everything is having a lot of hopes. Everything is having a lot of expectations. But the problem is huge. I mean, social inequality is there and has been there for many years. I mean, and, and, and the, the, the economic models that we have are only increasing that. So we are, from, I think community networks are showing that it's possible by sharing all these resources, by putting all these efforts in there. But um, at the same time, it would be a pity that all this movement, all this energy that we are all saying, all, all seeing, all these hopes, stops. So I think I'm pledging here maybe to all the donors and financiers in the, in the room to, to, to trust the process. I think to trust that many people here are doing their best on trying to understand a problem that is huge. We are talking about a lot of companies that have not been able to solve this problem. The unconnected remain unconnected because the problem is big. And with some funding and with some people putting a lot of their hearts and their minds into the problem, we are starting to see some some progress in understanding how this can be can, can be made and it would be a pity if there is no more resources in general to explore this in the next two three four five years it's not this is not going to get solved next year this is not going to get solved in 2020 we need to continue thinking and sharing and, and, and putting this together 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. It's, uh, that's a very motivational call for, uh, for this very uh, session that we're in. So, uh, Fett from IDSC. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's hard to follow Carlos. Um, particularly, we support his work. So anything I'm going to say, you have to sort of refer back to what he just said. But um, let me give you a little brief history of what IDRC has done in terms of sort of uh, connectivity, particularly in the Asia Pacific context. So that's where I'm based and that's where my work has mostly been. Um, the International Development Research Center is the Crown Corporation of Canada. We support development research in the area of what used to be called ICT for development. That's how old I am. I'm sure you don't even know what that term is. Um, we helped uh, establish um, first connectivities, um, not to say that we did the work, but we funded research that supported connectivity and ISPs established in Vietnam, Mongolia. My own work in UNDP was Timor-Leste, Laos, Bhutan, Nepal, just to name a few. Um, we realized early on that localization was an issue, particularly around language. So we supported regional um, localization um, of languages, Khmer, Lao, Bhutan, Bhutanese, and Nepali. So that just gives you a brief work um, of the past. And that was early 2000s. I feel right now, coming to the IGF, I don't know what is number 13, 14th, whatever it is, it's a, a restatement of the access question, yet again. Um, and my own program was, in the previous cycle, was focused on post-access issues, issues that assumed that access was over with. We were surely wrong. Um, we're back to that question yet again. Um, so during, again, the 2000s, we were involved in what was called the telecenter movement. Again, that shows me my age, telecenter or, or org. I don't know if you would remember. But that movement um, was pretty much squashed by what was the advent of mobile, or the adoption of mobile phones as the primary form of um, connectivity. Governments, private sectors, development sectors were investing in subsidizing these community hubs. Um, if you look, and I remember in India, we supported what was called Mission 2007, so 11 years ago, in the idea of connecting every village. Uh, the Indian government has now laid fiber. The question of sustainability, business models, access for what, these are still questions that remain, interesting enough. Um, now I'm going to state um, a question of strategy and approach, which does not reflect my organization. It reflects more of uh, my own personal view. I had a conversation with Carlos, I think a year ago, and he was asking me why was I interested in this, um, in this movement of community networks. And I explained it this way, and if you can bear with me, I'm gonna offer you an analogy. Uh, my glasses is ecology. This table is ecology. Uh, the wall is ecology. Um, the tree outside, I assume you would all agree, is ecology. Nature, capital N, is something entirely different. Nature, capital N, is green, is mother, uh, inherited from the Greeks, goddess. So here's the analogy I want to, if you can put that in your head. Here's the analogy I want to offer you. Um, ecology is to nature as infrastructure is to the internet. That was my response to Carlos. I think what we need is an ecolog ecological approach to access, not a mystification uh, or approach to the idea of access to a free and open thing. I think there's an advantage to thinking in that way because it addresses the question of sustainability. Just as ecology is um, sustainable and managed at the local level, so should be infrastructure, not this notion. And this is why I think we often see a disconnect. I've been to many of the IGFs. You see a disconnect between the people who talk about digital rights on the side of nature and the internet and mystification, and people who work on the physics of networks, like Paul Wilson and company, and Carlos, who work on the infrastructure of things. That, the, that disconnect of ecology and nature has to be met. And for me, that is community networks. This is why I was involved in the open source um, movement. This is why I support the community networks. I see a way, an alternative, and that's through an ecological approach, closer to the situation and the ecologies that people have access to. Again, that is not IDRC's position. That is my own <laughs> personal position. Um, and as uh, Carlos mentioned, there's a lot of hope involved. And I think that um, what community networks, and there's, um, not that we are, have evidence around this, but let's consider an intuition. Um, Carlos mentioned this hope around um, 
countering what seems to me like power symmetries. We have many discussions about data flows, misinformation, for example, and the hoarding of data, hoarding of flows in, uh, in infrastructure. I think community network offers an alternative to that hoarding and to that hierarchy. Um, in terms of our approaches that we support, I think Carlos can give you more um, examples and more detail. I'm just speaking in general terms. Um, we are a development research organization, so we support development research that involves in-depth case studies analysis. Um, this was published and launched by APC recently. I hope you grab a book that speaks to the, the very subject. Um, we support the movement around uh, open telecom data policy and regulation. Uh, championed by the likes of Steve Song. Uh, we believe in um, movement and awareness building. Uh, as Carlos mentions, we need a lot of that support. And uh, we believe in supporting emerging initiatives in cases where that uh, has shown sustainability. Thank you, Fett. That over my time. That's, you, that's your time. Oh, thank I you. I hate to cut <laughs> you off, but uh, uh, Carl from CEDA, what's your perspective about the ecology or otherwise? <laughs> Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is uh, Carl Elmstam and I work for the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, or CEDA. Uh, I, I will speak from uh, very much from, from my perspective as a, as a donor um, and specifically working in the, in the Unit for Sustainable Economic Development, where my focus is, is ICTs and digital development. Um, so when, when thinking of how we, or, or how to describe how, how we think um, when planning our investments, uh, the very starting point for that is the Swedish strategy um, in, in the area. And that strategy has a very strong focus on increased access. Uh, and I'd say that our, our current analysis uh, includes, of course, that the increased rate of people being connected has been dropping sharply over the last year. Um, and one could argue, as Carlos just did, uh, that the current business models, mobile networks, satellite, etc., are not sufficient uh, to reach all, or at least for, for a long time. So uh, combining that focus on access uh, with the emphasis that SEED always has on, on, uh, on reaching those in greatest need, or, or the poverty perspective, uh, it leads us to solutions like community networks. So it makes a lot of sense from us, for us. And uh, we also prioritize rights, a rights perspective and a gender perspective, and, and these seem to be, to me, things that are well, well integrated as community networks inherently gives power back to the local community. And over the last few days, I, I've heard many different uh, descriptions of, of things that stand in the way for community networks. It's spectrum, laws and regulation that need updating if community networks are to be given a fair chance. I've also heard some suggestions on how to overcome those obstacles, and I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. Um, and to me, it seems that communication is very key to enroll, uh, to enroll other organizations, and perhaps in my case, uh, it's about working within my own organization to activate other parts of it, not necessarily the ICT experts or, or, or the digital experts. So, so for example, we support uh, training of um, regulators in, in the Global South, but that's a completely other part of my organization that does that. And, and are we sure that uh, the one hand knows what the other does? Uh, well, I hope so in our case, <laughs> but I, I think that that's an important point. So communication, communicating with our colleagues, always increasing the number of people who are aware of community networks will of course help build that momentum and remove any inconsistent behaviors from large organizations. Uh, and another example, um, that I think is important to, to pay attention to uh, is how community networks uh, can generate jobs in the local community, that there is room for entrepreneurship and business opportunities uh, and where the profit uh, will stay and be reinvested in, in that community, um, which should make these projects uh, interesting to people who work with private sector development. Um, so we, we will have to be sure to speak to them as well. And again, I, I think the, we have uh, units that work with a focus on infrastructure uh, and infrastructure funds. And, and of course, we should see how community networks uh, complement in existing infrastructure and, and, and be sure to explain that in, in a way that 
infrastructure experts who might usually be focused on roads uh, can also understand community networks. And, and um, same would go for people working with uh, rural, etc., etc. So uh, with that, uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to speak here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Carl. Um, we have a, a trio of um, fairly major funders uh, here with us, so I'd like to ask um, Alberto Serta from Ford for a few remarks. Thank you very much. Um, to answer your questions, I need to introduce briefly at least what For Foundation does, so you can have a clear idea about what is the actual scope of the world work. Uh, For Foundation is one of the largest foundations in the U.S. Uh, it has a specific, it has several programs, but one of the programs is uh, Internet Freedom Program. This program basically provides support to organizations, public interest organizations, uh, advancing internet policies uh, with a human rights or a social justice perspective. Um, and uh, basically the program and the foundation in general, although we like to say that we are global, the truth is that we basically work in the US and, in, and we have 10 regional offices in different developing countries and from those 10 regional offices we are able to work in 14 different in 40 different countries worldwide, mainly sub-Saharan African countries, Latin American countries, and to some extent in some countries in, in the south of Asia. Um, until why, therefore, for Foundation engaged in the conversation about community network is basically because of the social justice implications. The fact that most of the people that are not connected are usually native communities, rural communities, people that usually are members of communities that have been marginalized for the society, for the economic system. Uh, until 2014, this program was fully dedicated only to the US. And as a result, there was some assumption that access wasn't an, a problem and main, most of the issues were associated with privacy and to net neutrality. Only that year in 2014, the program beca became uh, it started to operate beyond the United States, and at that point was necessary to reassess what was the scope of the actions and the subject matter that we were working with. And one of the issues that arise was access. We work in Indonesia, and at that time, barely 20% of the population has access to internet. We work in Kenya, and at that time, less than 50% of the population has access to internet. And therefore, there was room for working as a support foundation, as a social justice foundation, in order to overcome that, that gap. Uh, now, until to, during the first, I will say, first two years of the program working overseas, there was some investment in implementing community networks, particularly in Brazil and India. Uh, but at that point, we started to realize that or the limit, limited resources that we could commit to the field were not enough to satisfy the needs associated with implementing specific projects in specific communities. We're very limited, actually. And therefore, we need to make a reassessment about what was the actual role of our foundation to play in the field. But ultimately, we decided in 2015 was that if there was a distinctive role for the Ford Foundation to play in this field, it was about supporting organizations changing policies. What does it mean? It means a broad range of issues. This is not necessarily on related only to community network. It is about internet access, and, and therefore we have been supporting initiatives about litigation on municipal uh, network networks in the US, for instance. We have been supporting public transparency of the use of the Universal Service Fund in Nigeria. We have been supporting initiatives about increasing competitiveness in the telecommunications sector in Brazil. And we have been supporting also some initiatives about increasing advocacy for policy changes in Latin America related to uh, and community networks. So with that, I'm trying to say that answering the question of the moderator about what the foundation is doing and what is the foundation is looking at doing in the future in this area, basically to support those initiatives that are trying to change the policies, so it's the policy level, in these countries where we are operating, which currently are basically 40 different countries worldwide. I hope that that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Now, moving along, Jane Coffin, uh, ISOC has had uh, a lot of interest and reaffirmed its interest in community networking. What can you share with us in four minutes, <laughs> more or less? I'll try to be, I'm sorry, I'll try to be brief. Um, part of ISOC's uh, vision, which I think many of you know, is that the internet's for everyone. That sounds a little simple, but um, our new CEO, who is Andrew Sullivan, who comes from the technical community, has been pretty clear that everyone is everyone and all of us, yeah, um, and around the world. So the, the focus of the Internet Society, because the internet is for everyone and we focus on access, technology, openness, sustainability, and interoperability. So it's that nexus between development, technology, and policy with what we're doing. We have four campaigns running this year. Community Networks has been one of those campaigns. It's not our first uh, experience with Community Networks. We've been doing this work for over 11 years. Um, and at the heart of what we do are projects that have proven that what we've been doing in partners around the world, critically, because it's through our chapters, people like APC, others in the room, Altermundi, Razmarica, Ucha from Georgia, who's sitting over here as well. Nothing gets done without partners, and our objective is to turn the work that we're trying to instigate into back to the community, so that it's community run and led. We can help push and pull in different ways with funding, with training, and with other technical um, specifics. But right now what we're doing from a strategic perspective is running a campaign focused on community networks, on capacity development, community development, and technical development and policy as an underpinning role and communications with that. Next year we'll continue that campaign, which is being tied together not only from that campaign perspective, but with a foundation. That's a new thing. It was just announced um, <laughs> last week. Um, the foundation will focus on chapter capacity building, which also is something that is helping around the world develop community networks in some areas or help focus on policy change, uh, as Alberto is saying and working with organizations like the African Union to push that, or colleagues in the Pacific or Latin America. Um, community capacity building is one of the, the second tranche, uh, disaster relief and recovery and research. So the research arm and the community building arm, which is focused on community networks and chapter capacity building, are three different pieces that may have a way and a role to help fund community networks. The key thing is to talk to our partners in the community, and we need to do more of that to understand where they also think the funding should go. So my guess is that we'll be looking at bringing in um, observers to help the foundation formulate where it best can go on some of those aspects. But the critical thing is not to try and make these decisions on our own, but work with the community of interest to try and focus on what they also think is most important. I would say that when I first started at the Internet Society, um, I was impressed by the work that had been going on in internet exchange points and the actual physicality of the work being done. It was, they were made, <laughs> they were sustained, and they were continued with partnerships, like with APNIC and LACNIC and everyone around the world that we work with. It wasn't what I call an empty aid promise. I've worked on aid projects for five years in the former Soviet republics, and in some of those countries, you might as well have thrown the money out the window of an airplane as you flew over the country might have benefited the community. Some projects were very effective, but I learned a lot of hard lessons about what it means to build communities. And if you don't start with that process, which Carlos spoke about, you've got nothing. So I would say that these small projects are worthwhile because their, their social impact is huge, but the impact investment, which is the new term in the community, right? Social impact investment. This is what that does with community networks. It's not just about the technology. With IXPs, we used to say that it's the human engineering, which is 85 to 90 percent of the work, right? The technology is going to work on its own if you know how to install it, which is part of what the Libra, uh, Libra router, Libra mesh is about, is making it easy. The tech is there, the hard work is being done by the technologists, but if you don't have that human engineering work done, you've got nothing left. We know with uh, V6 deployment and other technical deployments, that's the humans as well, right? You've got to instigate that in countries. So this is not as so different. It's a different formulation on the ground and community building in that sense. But it has huge impact from what I've seen. So I think they're extremely worthwhile and it's, um, it's not a, an empty promise, as I would say. Thanks very much, Jane. So this, uh, this joint uh, workshop uh, is about the 
funding and financial models. Uh, and although, as Jane said, it's not all about the technology, there may be some technology uh, opportunities and impacts that can be taken into account. So, um, Stavrula, can you tell us where you're coming from in this place? Uh, I'm Stavrula Manglavera, coming from the University of uh, Thessaly, and uh, I would like uh, to uh, give you a little bit of uh, the history of what the European Commission uh, has uh, done uh, the last uh, five, six uh, years uh, for uh, grassroots uh, initiatives and community networks. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, the program uh, initiative called uh, collective, collective Awareness for Sustainability and Social uh, Innovation that uh, support uh, more than uh, 30 uh, quite big uh, projects uh, where involvement, uh, the, uh, the involvement of uh, community networks and uh, uh, communities in uh, general uh, were uh, uh, supported. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it was uh, the engagement, supported the engagement of uh, the community networks and uh, the initiatives uh, uh, through the use of uh, digital uh, and uh, information technology. So a lot of uh, during uh, the life uh, of uh, these uh, projects, a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, digital tools uh, have been developed uh, for the engagement and empowerment of uh, the community networks. And uh, there are, uh, and uh, it was uh, one of the first uh, initiatives that the uh, European Commission uh, included uh, all of the, uh, uh, these initiatives uh, in the actual uh, implementation of uh, the project. It was a, a bottom-up it's a, a bottom -up approach and uh, the tools have been uh, implemented uh, uh, with uh, the active involvement of uh, the communities uh, participated in uh, this project. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, I'm also uh, representing uh, one of the uh, uh, the horizontal actions that support uh, this, uh, this uh, specific uh, project. So there is a, a, a list of uh, tools and uh, best practices and uh, pilots uh, implemented uh, within uh, these uh, years uh, that uh, you can find it un under the CAPSI website. Uh, it's uh, www capsi.eu and uh, you can find uh, uh, the status of uh, the uh, all this uh, implementation that they uh, have, have been made. Uh, as a support action, uh, we also uh, provide to the community different tools uh, how to get uh, together and uh, what, uh, where to find uh, uh, tools for uh, sustainability or uh, other uh, or, and the collaboration between the different uh, uh, groups. Uh, so at oh, the same time, uh, since uh, uh, the future is in front uh, of us, uh, we created uh, the DSI manifesto uh, that uh, includes uh, uh, the key topics uh, that uh, the uh, different uh, stakeholders uh, uh, would like to see in the next uh, coming uh, years uh, to, uh, to be included in uh, the strategy and uh, the discussion and also, of course, all this includes uh, the uh, the technology, the different technologies uh, that uh, there are around, and um, the other thing uh, that. Uh uh, I would like uh, to uh, point out is the uh, European Commission uh, nowadays uh, issued a, um, a commence a new uh, project called the Next Generation Internet. The presentation was uh, yesterday and the workshop uh, for that. So community networks can be part of uh, this initiative and they can uh, uh, continue using uh, these uh, technologies and uh, tools of uh, internet uh, so to be uh, uh, sustainable and to continue towards this way. Thank you very much. Uh, Sylvia Molina, you have been working on P2P technologies, I think. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I don't know if I can answer any of the questions, but uh, I wanted to talk about inclusion. I think that has to do with sustainability and also with social justice. Uh, well, I'm an anthropologist. I'm working on a research project called Peer-to-Peer -peer Models at the Complutense University in Madrid, Spain. Uh, our project's principal goal is to co-create uh, decentralized tools with communities. 
decentralized tools like uh, with blockchain. Blockchain is known uh, because of the cryptocurrencies, but uh, it, it brings also possibilities in terms of governance, related with governance. Uh, with no intermediaries, uh, one community uh, can translate part of their uh, governance rules into the code. Uh, then uh, or those, uh, they have to decide what they want to automate or not. And I think this is a um, good opportunity to review or to speak about all the processes within the community, all the tags, including the usually forgotten ones, uh, like for example, the caring work or the emotional labor. Um, of course, making this co-creation process uh, really inclusive is uh, a big challenge. Uh, but uh, for the previously mentioned reasons, this uh, making the rules uh, into code, translating the, the rules into code, uh, with blockchain is much more, the, inclu the inclusion is much more important. It is crucial. Um, we worked, uh, well, uh, my project, our project worked uh, with a network community, our first case study. Uh, that had a very male culture. And in that case, for example, uh, our main worry was how the tool could reflect or reproduce all that power relationships within the community. So uh, I, I only wanted to talk about the social part of a project that works with blockchain, I think uh, it has a lot of potential, uh, but... Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Uh, Panayotis, I think uh, you're another person here with blockchain uh, interest and experience. Yes, I recommended myself to talk because I wanted to have a debate, so I will be a little provocative. Uh, I am a co-founder of an organization called NetHood, and uh, we try to bridge, uh, as we say, the, phys the physical with the digital and also different disciplines and uh, research and action. And uh, I will talk here with two hats, my, an old hat. I, was, uh, I took my PhD on economic incentives uh, of peer-to-peer -peer systems. Actually, my community later evolved to create the BitTorrent and uh, now the blockchain came out of this community of peer-to-peer -peer systems. And as the dissemination leader of the Net Commons project, and I want to talk about incentives and uh, narratives. And uh, I will say that blockchain has many problems as a technology. First of all, it has a built-in by construction speculation element because it requires more and more resources to be cons uh, invested by the peers of the system. So uh, since the cost increases, then uh, when you put monetary incentives to this, the price increases, and this is a, a built-in speculation uh, part. It is very highly uh, energy inefficient. It consumes a lot of energy. And I think the fact that releases us from the trust building process is uh, not a benefit, but a, a, a short, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. Because creating trust is one of the most important processes in community building, and when you have a, an algorithm doing this for you, it's not good. And I will talk about incentives, and uh, I would say the, there is, uh, when we talk about blockchain community networks, there are many initiatives today that try to combine these two. And uh, I want to talk first about Freifunk, which is a community network in Germany where people uh, share their unused capacity, the, their internet, without any incentives, and they have created a firmware that makes sure that uh, their own consumption is not influenced by those that use their own network. And this is enough for them to do it, and not only they do it for themselves, but they put resources for what I call the right to share. It is a very important element to make community networks successful, to claim our right to share our internet connectivity. On the other extreme, there are all these new initiatives like RightMess, uh, Amber, SkyCoin, that exactly for the same type of activity, sharing our uh, spare capacity, 
they add to it very strong economic incentives. Amber says, share your Wi-Fi, get paid, extend the internet using viral profit mo motives. For me, this is problematic because it somehow assumes that this is the problem why we don't share our internet connectivity. But for me, the problem is not that we don't have enough economic <coughs> incentives, but we don't have the means to share it without protecting ourselves. If we make the analogy with Airbnb, Airbnb helps us to share our shared rooms. In the case of the internet, it's not even so difficult to share our internet connection. It could be just a configuration option. So I think we should fight more on the policy and regulation to allow the right to share. Then some people could say that Freifunk is a little bit of an extreme community. It's like the couch surfing, let's say, analog of the Airbnb. Maybe we need also some more robust economic schemes. And for this, GUIF is a very good example also of a, a sustainable model based on market rules, uh, sharing internet connectivity among peers. And here there is another obstacle, which is the right to use, the right to use the public infrastructure. And this is what GUIF struggles today, and we were lucky, some of us, to be in the, in the European Ombudsman where the GUIFI submitted a complaint because they are not uh, illegally are not given the right to use infrastructure. Given this right, we have a very good model that is easy to replicate. It's better to replicate than have GUIFI grow. And we can have a very sustainable model that without any other extra speculation incentives of profit uh, or things like that. So my statement is that we should focus more on making community networks uh, viable and legal, and then the economic incentives are there, than uh, trying to create some sort of a narrative that uh, we need the profit to make uh, the community networks sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paniotis. Uh, I, I do hope that uh, sparks some debate and some uh, imaginative thought about um, exactly what this this panel is about, uh, which is to identify opportunities for um, community networks to prosper and grow. Uh, lastly on the list, uh, Nicholas uh, from Altamundi. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Nicholas from Altamundi. I'm, I, I'm also the current uh, chair of the CNC, the Community Networks Special Interest Group. Um, first of all, I wanted to share uh, a little bit of the document that came out from the Latin American Summit of Community Networks that met on September this year. Um, one of the, the issues that we discussed during this summit uh, was actually uh, funding and how, how we could improve or what we can tell to our funders. So, there are many things that were identified as important. Um, so one of them is that we believe that community networks at this point need funding as a collective, not just as individual projects. That we have needs that are shared, like for example, uh, policy and regulatory incidents, or technological development, uh, training strategies, and social impact that are not projects from one specific community, but uh, shared among us. Um, also, um, we believe that it would be interesting to have uh, more projects uh, funded with smaller grants uh, instead of uh, funding a few with lots of money. And actually what I would say is every community network project needs to be funded. I think that is uh, one objective uh, that should be put on the table. I know of uh, many of the processes of funding in Beyond the Net, Frida, etc., that had great projects presented to their calls and they just cannot get selected because there's a limited amount of projects that can be chosen. 
And if we are really committed to connected the uncon connecting the unconnected or to letting the unconnected connect themselves, if they are there and they are saying, hey, we want to connect ourselves, we have the drive, we have the project, well, we should somehow guarantee that ha they have the initial funding. Um, there's also the importance of uh, making universal service funds available to community networks. And I think that uh, funders, uh, international organizations, cooperation agencies uh, could focus on how to help community networks make a credible case for their governments to actually design lines through which they can assign um, universal service funds. Um, another important thing is that uh, we believe that we need to have objective studies about the cost of deployment of community networks and also uh, studies regarding their social value. Um, so community networks deployments can be somehow compared to other options. We know that at this point in time, um, in some way community networks are competing with uh, big company projects regarding, for example, the Universal Service Fund. I have shared many panels with GSMA people or, well, telcos, and they are arguing that they need governments to subsidize demand, which means that governments should put the money they received from these same guys uh, and give it to the people to pay for uh, the profit of these companies. Uh, to me, this, may, this makes really no sense but it's being pushed forward each time with more energy. And so I think we, we need to build a strong case for community networks. And the most uh, important thing, I think, is to, to make the, the movement, the collective, more present, to have less focus on specific projects and specific communities, but to rely more on the collective. I think that uh, the CNC, for example, the, the Community Network Special Interest Group has a role there to work a bit as a federation of community networks. And there are others, the, the, the African group is already established for many years. I think we should rely more on that and I think that funders could also uh, in some way relate to these collectives to help identify the, the more important projects to fund and the strategies because it's those collectives that know uh, what is needed uh, to, to move forward, to scale up. So that's, that's my, my point. Thank you very much, Nicholas. So that, that's the end of a collection of speakers. I think a great, a great credit to uh, the organisers for bringing together such a diverse, uh, diverse group. But there's more. Uh, thanks to everyone for keeping to four minutes. But I'd like to open the floor because we've got quite a few practitioners and experts here who I'm sure have got some comments in response or some answers to the three, the three questions. Uh, so please, um, if anyone would like to contribute. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yourself. This is very inspirational. I'm Dr. Tan Tong Kang. I come from Myanmar. I'm from the Myanmar Book Aid and Preservation Foundation. Uh, it's really inspirational uh, hearing from all of you. Uh, first of all, I heard that these uh, tele centers. So, first of all, I have to uh, explain to you a little bit about our projects in Myanmar. So, we work with a number of libraries, community libraries. So, this is a, it's a Fortunately, we have over 6,000 libraries across the country, and this is a strong network. This is a trusted organization, uh, trusted by the community. So what we do is very simple. We provide three things. One is a free internet, two device, three training. 
So these first two are provided by the telcos. We, we approach the many telcos, and one of the telcos uh, sponsored that. So training part, we, we partner with a number of uh, international organizations, including uh, University of Washington, which we develop a curriculum called uh, mobile information literacy. Because the reason why we have to choose a mobile base uh, information literacy is that uh, in Myanmar, 80, over 80 percent of the people go online using the mobile phone, but they don't know the potential of this this tool. You know, most of the people we really use less than 10 percent of these tools on the mobile. So that's what we developed the curriculum, and we are delivering this uh, training across this library. So initially, there was only 55 libraries that we work in. 2015. Now the network is expanded to uh, 150. So that's where we started to all develop other projects such as the uh, gender, like tech age girls, which we, we got the award from ICEF this year. And also we are working with Walmart Foundation and IREX on the, uh, the safe migration. In Myanmar, many of the people uh, migrate to other countries because of the lack of, I mean, because of the poverty. So one, uh, you mentioned about social justice, which is a really, uh, is true for our country because many of these migrant uh, workers are exploited in Thailand or Malaysia uh, because of these uh, problems, but they don't have any information. So through these libraries, we provide all the library, uh, the information. We even develop a uh, chatbot. The reason we use a chatbot is that uh, in Myanmar, Facebook is dominating. So many people are familiar with using the Facebook than the mobile apps. Or I think you might, technologists are here also, you can also educate me. In order to get the successful mobile app, you need to do a lot of promotion, you know, awareness. But the chatbot, I think, is very fast because they are already familiar with the uh, Facebook, you know. So that is a part, uh, I don't know how the, you can uh, explain to me about the maybe other technologies uh, involved in that. So this is some of the projects that we are working on that and community network is so important in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to maybe um, invite some of our colleagues from uh, community networks that are present in the room. Do you mind uh, raising your hand, those of you who are working uh, in community networks or developing community networks? Are there, um, I mean, uh, for me, sort of the uh, sort of most, most uh, interesting aspect of, of this workshop, um, you know, was to be sort of the discussion and, um, and hearing from, from your communities, you know, what you think uh, is sort of uh, important to be supported and funded or sort of maybe sort of share a bit of your experiences uh, on the ground. So I don't know if anyone wants to maybe take the floor. Thanks. Okay, I, my name is Damian from Adela Chasur from Argentina. Uh, we are a community network uh, that is also in the CNC, just like uh, Nicolas mentioned. Um, most of our uh, point of views are, uh, are mentioned in, in that uh, brief re resume from Nicolas. Um, we think that the regulatory point is important. Uh, we work uh, together with the regulatory in, in our country um, to, to solve uh, the, the problems that we have to uh, implement the, the networks. And that's the, the same hist history in, in other countries of the region and, and in the world uh, with the community networks. Um, we, just like Nicolas said, uh, we receive also many other um, uh, situations of communities that want to deploy a network. And it's important to, to um, evaluate every case and uh, see if there is another uh, another uh, potential network that can be deployed in that region uh, and if there are uh, all the uh, conditions uh, given to, to deploy that network or if there is another um, help that is uh, needed to to, uh, to to give connectivity to that region. We think that the um, 
community networks are the, the crucial uh, point to give connectivity in, uh, in many regions and, and, and towns and, and places that if uh, there is uh, no uh, community network, then there, there will be nothing to connect uh, the, the people that live there. Uh, so that uh, it will be important to uh, take those points uh, in uh, to, to take uh, to um, to to think about those points uh, when we talk about uh, community networks we, because uh, it's important to take care about the, the regulations but also the need of um, infrastructure for the new communities in, in uh, some cases in some places and um, there, there, there aren't uh, a lot of uh, different problems in, 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 in different regions because there, there are, um, we, we can count uh, the problems with, with, with one hand or, or with two hands, uh, I mean uh, there are always the, the same problems in, in different regions um, and we can uh, resolve them with the, the government and the, and the uh, investment uh, and not very high invest investments that was what we want to, to show that if we could do that uh, with, with, the, with the funds we have then with some help we can improve uh, that uh, situation very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Hello. Um, my name is Guy Ribarren from Maltramundi. Uh, I also wanted to highlight the role of the community members in self-funding the initiatives. We have been working for many years uh, as Altramundi uh, without any external funding and successfully deploying networks with the help of the people. And uh, I think uh, I, I've seen many projects fail with external funding because of an attitude of saying, oh, we are helping these poor people that don't have any money or means of... And this normally creates a relationship uh, with the people that it's not uh, sustainable, or I wouldn't know how to say this in English. Um, so I think it, it, it can become very powerful if both external funders acknowledge this capacity of the communities of making little investments that also change a lot the attitude of the people regarding these technologies and this network that they are building because they start to feel that it's also their own network and not so much something from outside. And I think if blockchain people have any chance of uh, helping, it could be in this ground where uh, there are some initiatives of uh, cryptocurrencies more um, ecological in terms of uh, power consumption and things like this that could potentially enable local people to um, generate local economies. I think this could be a way, but... Uh, Adam Burns, you've been involved with NetComs. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Adam Burns. I've been involved in community networking initiatives for um, probably about 16, 17 years in one form or another. Um, and I'd really like to uh, underline some of the points made by the previous few speakers in terms of, um, I, th I feel that there's sometimes a, a small uh, multi-layered use of the word community. Most of the time I would class a, a community network as, as something that does have a sense of high ownership of its own infrastructure and that can have um, great value in terms of understanding their communication requirements in their local areas and being able to make 
uh, informed decisions upon the growth and the sustainability, both of their culture and their community, and the infrastructure that supports that. And I think uh, further to just some of the funding models here, that uh, both mechanized algorithms such as uh, uh, blockchain or um, uh, mechanisms that automate uh, community or cultural decisions on these communications and or um, funding both have their problematic sides. They may well be um, suitable for, for some areas, for some uses, but, but I think they should be examined uh, very, very carefully. And that I think, uh, again, I'd like to repeat that my view of community networks is that they are an opportunity for uh, a locality com complete with its culture to be able to start to provide their own local communication requirements, uh, often filling the gaps, as um, Ramon Rocker and Steve Song would say, uh, filling the air gaps between uh, buckets full of stones that communicate uh, the communi community networks can act as sand or water to fill the gaps of those communication requirements. Thank you very much. Julian. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> uh, the experience is that uh, my name is Julian Casas Buenas from Colnodo in Colombia. Uh, from our experience in uh, supporting community networks, uh, we believe that um, uh, we still need uh, support to maintain broadband access and a stable access because uh, in some regions um, uh, we can uh, get uh, some kind of connectivity but it's not uh, really um, stable yeah, and um, um, the, um, the, the bandwidth is uh, not enough to have all the um, benefits from, from the internet. Um, and uh, also um, uh, access to new technologies to support this, uh, this broadband access is uh, important. Um, we are facing problems with uh, our government to access to spectrum for um, uh, community networks of uh, uh, mobile um, um, mobile phones, uh, uh, replicating the experience of uh, Rizomatica in Mexico. So it's necessary still to work with the government and try to uh, create this uh, regulatory environment uh, that is appropriate for the deployment of, uh, of uh, these networks. And um, also appropriation of, of the technology for uh, these uh, communities that uh, has been disconnected for so long. So it's important to have uh, more training uh, workshop to teach them about the models of operation, not only technical but administrative as well. Uh, to make them uh, sustainable and uh, uh, showing them uh, other models that we have in, in the in other parts of the world. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Pinda Wong, can I just acknowledge uh, you? Thanks for joining us. Pinda uh, is someone who knows about blockchain at an international scale. Do you see a, a opportunity for blockchain at a very local level, Pinda? Thanks, Paul. Um, let me actually, I do, and f for several reasons. Actually, the gentleman who spoke about incentives, uh, I think, is, is right on the money. Um, and I think it is actually about the money, which is kind of interesting. Um, I've been involved uh, in the wilderness of uh, playing around with Bitcoin for a, f for a few years. And what I think we are in terms of, of driving incentives and finding resources, the language of money is extremely powerful. It's a way we can organize economic activity. It's a way that we can plan for the long term. Uh, it's a way that we can secure resources. But the way we're thinking about money these days, I think in, in a Bitcoin, Bitcoin is almost 10 years old. There are, what, 2,000 different cryptocurrencies. Yes, there are a lot of uh, innovations, a lot of problems as well, right? It's not, the technology is, is very difficult to scale. But I would point to th really three things. First of all, you know, the, the age of the internet was sort of like permissionless innovation, right? So that's yeah. the sort of the internet age. We're sort of the, the, the Bitcoin age is like sort of permissionless monetization. In other words, making money right now is literally a command line, you know, make money, enter. 
So what this is really quite, kind of clever is that we can actually very finely grain and uh, design economic and social incentives at a very, very granular level. Um, some people call this um, uh, crypto economics, some call it token engineering. I'm not quite sure what it is, but what it is it, in my mind is saying, well, what, what can this community agree with uh, as a means of exchange so that we can actually do stuff? So a lot of criticism is about the definition of money as the store of value, unit of exchange, and um, uh, unit of account, sorry, medium of exchange. Well, I would say it's none of that. It's an agreement within the community with which to use for building consensus. Mm -hmm. So for the very first time, community networks can use these, these, this software, because it is only just software, to start saying, I don't trust you, you don't trust me, but let's try and work together, let's try and trust the software. So what's interesting now is I think the means of exchange can be, can be had to bridge these gaps between the, the stones, so to speak, to design incentives. It's a question of how. One of the thinking mistakes, I think, with nearly all the cryptocurrencies and blockchain are that they're very zero sum. And in other words, they've really just taken the physical money unit, which is either I have it or you have it. Um, and I don't really see that as being very, very useful. In fact, I think the biggest thing is, is, is with digital, we, have, um, we had to invent scarcity, right? Because everything was freely shared. So the, work, the research work I'm doing right now is with refugees and trying to, to, to invent um, what's called yin money or female money, right? which is basically non-zero sum. So how do you have a positive sum economic uh, token whereby you can start generating trust automatically? So there's still research, it's still early stage, but the good news is, is that I think there's a different kind of conversation that we can have that's different from when Fed was, was doing his, his rounds sort of the last sort of 20 years, because now we have the means of exchange. We also have peer-to-peer um, markets like uh, Open Bazaar, whereby you can actually trade peer-to-peer -peer online. So not only do you have the means of exchange right now, you also have the means of production because nearly all the uh, intangible assets, goods and services can be produced originally in a digital form. We can have provenance there. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity now to have a, this conversation because there's a new tool in the toolbox with blockchain. Thank you. Can I throw it back to our funding partners here and, uh, and ask you perhaps if, um, would you see, um, and here's a question, would you see uh, reference to blockchain as a, as a feature or a bug in a, uh, in a funding proposal regarding uh, community networks? And I mean, that's a little facetious, but would you, um, what else have you heard here today that you think might be a, a relevant hook uh, on which to hang a, a, a sort of justification, a, a case for, um, for working together in a new way with uh, community networks? Um, it's not about what I have heard so far, but what I haven't heard. Uh, I'm from Chile, so I'm not going to make this argument for the sake of my country. Uh, Mexico is a country where 40% of the population has no access to internet, and some of the most successful initiatives on community networks came from Mexico. And the new government has decided to embrace community networks as a main priority for implementing national policy for providing access to that 40% of the population that is unconnected. That has some downsides and some high side. The downsides is that they are assuming that community networks operate from the top to down, top down policy. On the, on the bright side, you have pol policy will and you have financial support for implementing community networks in that country. And I'm surprised that nobody has mentioned the possibility of uh, making of community networks a government policy and to which extent that has um, opportunities or the challenges associated and to which extent this community in particular can engage with the Mexican government or Mexican authorities to inform that policy making and to make it, make it work. Okay, Phipps, um, here, and we have a couple of online questions actually. Considering the fact that I helped co-edit a, uh, a white paper on blockchain for developments and Pinder kindly reviewed, um, I'm on the fence uh, uh, in terms of if I ever saw a blockchain come through in a proposal. I think it's early days and I think the two speakers that talked about the trust level. Um, as a researcher, I wonder at what scale does trust um, is between the people and, and then is it between machines or f from machines? Um, so I think uh, the, 
the easy answer for me is it depends on what the research question is. And I think at the heart of it, since this is about, um, this whole forum is about trust, it's interrogating trust, be it from blockchain or anything else. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple more here uh, and a couple online. Uh, we only have 12 minutes or so left, so let's keep it to a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, and thank you for opening the space. Uh, I'm Nicolas from Altermundi. Altermundi has been talking a little bit, so I will be brief. Uh, I have been uh, around uh, for on the community network arena for a few years, and in particular, my role within the organization has been to visit the different communities around the world that are doing these things. And uh, uh, so uh, in something that I haven't been here much uh, is uh, on one side, community networks is so it's not an, any other kind of network that you can deploy top down. We are talking about the wills of others. And, uh, and talking about that, I feel that uh, something that we need to acknowledge is that it's not, our, it's not our take for community networks to exist or to flourish, but it's our, we, we are in a capacity to facilitate that process, to make it, to enable an environment that, is, that makes this sense. So on our, on our side, that is not the deploying side, it's actually the, the we are not being the ones that are creating an enabling environment for the, for the communities to thrive. We need to think about what things we can do on our side. And that, that means like, yes, funding is one, like uh, articulating with governments that are the ones that should be the, the, uh, talking about these things, uh, finding means for them to uh, engage with the communities, creating regulations that are enabling for them to, to do things that are not impose, imposing restrictions, but creating opportunities for the communities to do it. Um, and um, uh, at, at the funding level, creating like what Nico was saying, like uh, keep having chances for the communities to approach in, uh, investment in a, in a much easier way and not in a way that distracts the communities, but builds on top of their capacity to do things. Can we take one of the online questions? Okay, um, we actually have uh, two online questions for a while. I think they could probably be combined. Um, firstly, we have Uluwaseun Ajani from Nigeria, and he's asking all of the organizations re represented, and in particular the Ford Foundation, um, what are you doing to ensure that rural students in sub-Saharan Africa, living where there's an absence of reliable connection to the e electricity grid, um, get the benefits of community networks for their studies. And we also have Arvin Kamberi from the Diplo Foundation. He asks, we had P2P standards from the beginning of the internet. How can blockchain help now if we know that it needs a large computational power to be secure, it, if it is open blockchain? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take one more, and then if there's any responses to those questions, then please. Maybe we can take the. I, I will be just adding a bit. Okay. Uh, There's a specific question for Ford. In the case of Ford Foundation, we are currently working with uh, 10 different organizations in sub Saharan African countries, including three of them in, in Nigeria. Uh, and since the questions come from Nigeria, uh, the three initiatives that we are supporting in Nigeria are about public transparency associated to the Universal Service Fund. A second one is a, 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 to a group. It's, we, we're not providing project support there. We provide general support so organizations decide exactly what is their priority. The second project is about um, digital security for human rights defenders and other people at risk. And the third initiative is about uh, an organization that probably many of you may know, Paradigm Initiative, that covers initiatives from digital literacy to digital policy. So it's a pretty comprehensive uh, piece of work in particular from our program. In addition to that, we have an office in, in Lagos and that particular office is providing support to over 40 different initiatives, but then my knowledge of them is I'm not directly in, engaged in those initiatives so it's for was the regional office. Was there any work on the question of electrical power supply, or for that matter, are there any other comments since, on that Since question? the program I work for is about internet freedom issues, and it's as, I'm assuming that electricity is there, I don't do work on that particular area. But again, I have, we have offices there, we have uh, different other initiatives from my colleagues working on empowering of a women's right, inter, um, and on educational issues, as well as on um, 
I'm forgetting what, civic space and civic engagement. And I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with all the programming of the 10 offices and 40 program officers working worldwide uh, for four foundations. So it's a question for the regional office. Giant. I would just say for the, the remote uh, participant that the Fantuam Foundation, which John Dada, is John here? Uh, he's on the other panel. There's an indigenous connectivity panel on community networks uh, in another room. But we can put you together with that person. John Dada does work in, well, not only in computer literacy training with orphans and women in remote parts of Nigeria, but he's also been participating in all the community network training sessions, summits that Carlos and my colleague Machuki have been working on for the last three to four years. Um, one thing I wanted to add about funding and to support Nico's point, we've got to really figure out and work with community networks to know what it is they need versus what we think they need because um, <laughs> um, we don't know that local environment as well as they do. And this is also with any project that I think we've been working on from a technical side too is that they, they know best how they can consume that funding and they can use it. And we've seen, um, I don't know the right word, I call it flooding people with money. <laughs> if you give too much money to a project, people may, it may be divisive, it may not be uh, as good on the development side. I know it's hard for larger institutions to give out smaller grants. We've been doing that. Um, we know that that's intensive but we're not gonna stop. We may be giving more in the future, but we, I think collectively we could think of ways to also look at the longer range uh, distribution of funds. But I've become a, a bit of um, not very popular internally, I think, on occasion, because now I think that no money should go outside our organization now without specific training. We've tried to do some basic uh, management training, and I don't mean this from a capitalist perspective, so take it as a, a way that we could work with you on the right word, but how to manage the funds and how to manage projects, perhaps not with the more sophisticated networks in the world right now, but we've seen the, the challenge that giving someone money can, can take and that you do have to make sure they, they know what to, how to manage it in some ways. Thanks, Jay. Um, so, um, regarding uh, Jane's comment, I, I think that one way to maybe make this sub-granting or small grants possible would be to try to coordinate with community networks collectives so that the collective can manage a bigger fund to distribute at small bootstrap funds for uh, uh, initiating projects. Um, I also wanted to mention, again, from the uh, Latin American Summit document, other things that are not money, but are resources. And I think that many times our donors also have the capacity to, to work on regulatory issues and to help us uh, push forward uh, this initiative. So I will just point the, what's written here. It's in more detail in the document if you want to access it in the cnc.info website. Uh, we talk about uh, idle bandwidth. It's, that's one thing that's for free and we just need to manage it correctly. In the case of Altermundi, we are using the bandwidth for, from a national university, and we use all the bandwidth during the time that the university is closed. And this is replicated in some other cases. This should be generalized, <laughs> like we should do this everywhere. Um, extension of public access points. Governments usually uh, set up public access points, but there's no uh, policy to let the people extend those points through community <coughs> mesh networks, and that would be very interesting. Community management of government plans, because also it's very frequent that governments install some access point or some infrastructure, then they leave it there and some months or years afterwards, it doesn't work anymore. Community management of those programs would be great. Um, access to infrastructure, 
we are always fighting for this. We need to use the towers, the ducts, the infrastructure that's already there, but for very small communities, it's really difficult to get to talk to the players that control those structures. Um, also, free interconnection and free transit. Uh, many states have big um, fiber optic network networks that are mostly idle, idle, and community networks <laughs> could really benefit from uh, peering with those uh, networks. And also, and this is, uh, well, this would be interesting to discuss, uh, what Tier 1 networks could provide a free transit agreement to community networks. If we are really, and, and I always come back to this, are we really committed <laughs> to connecting the unconnected? So if we are committed, there are many things like this that are just free. We only need to talk about it. No? And so I think it's important to identify these uh, low-hanging fruits, as my, uh, the other Nico usually says, and, and go for them. No? Thanks. Thank you. That's an excellent summary of a whole lot of points, and I think it reflects your, um, your great knowledge of, um, of a wide range of networks in your work. Pindar, you had a point? Yes, I do. I wanted to respond to the question online about uh, energy consumption for some of these blockchain networks. Um, I think that's absolutely true, um, it's at least in the current uh, generation of blockchain networks that use proof of work. Just to give you an idea, as of today, the Bitcoin network has 43 million um, terahashes per second uh, that consumes a lot of energy. And there are protocols out there for consensus that may not use proof of work. Um, the one that you may want to look at is uh, by Bram Cohen, who invented, obviously, BitTorrent, uh, the, that famous peer-to-peer -peer network. He has got ChiaNet or ChiaCoin, and you can look at that. But again, you, it's unclear whether or not any of these systems work. They may work in theory, but they may no, not work in practice. So Bitcoin has evolved this crazy ecosystem out of nothing uh, to this level of, of computational power, which is probably beyond, beyond many state actors to try and actually attack. So the point I was trying to make, though, is that you don't need to actually be a miner to use the network, right? You just need the, bit, uh, the Bitcoin token to be able to access this, 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 uh, this blockchain itself and okay. the security thereof. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Pindo. I, I realize we have hit the end of our time, so I'm, I'm sorry for uh, not having a better, a better wrap-up than this, but I think the last couple of comments were, uh, served that purpose very well. So thank you all for, uh, for coming. Thanks for your contributions.